Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the executive editor of Dataverse. Excuse me, the chief digital manager. I got to update my title. Um, we'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data webinar series with Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss streaming analytics for the Internet of Things oriented applications. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right hand corner of your screen or if you like to tweet we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag smart data. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our series speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering acad academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage in areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, and the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and thanks to everybody out there. Um, sometimes when I start these, I feel like I'm talking about my kids. You know, it's like, oh yes, you're all my favorite, but when I Look at this topic, it certainly is a favorite for me, looking at uh, the futures uh, as we move to a world of streaming analytics and in particular, um, as we look at the opportunities that uh, the IoT is gonna bring to us. So to kick it off, uh, I'd like you to imagine for a minute a world where everything and everyone is connected. Augmented and instrumented reality is reality. So. Let's talk now about how close we are to that world, how we'll get there, and how you should prepare now to thrive in it. Uh, spoiler alert, we're almost there. So today what we're gonna do is I'm gonna present some context, uh, what the IoT does for us in terms of new data demands and opportunities. Then I'm gonna uh, outline sort of a, a view of what streaming analytics is, what it's all about, uh, the types of technologies and the types of uh, questions you should be asking. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the open source projects and libraries that are supporting uh, streaming analytics and supporting IoT development. And then uh, briefly close with a look at what some of the interesting vendors are doing in this space. So starting out, when everything's connected, what happens? And when I say everything's connected, I mean that every uh, device, every, uh, basically everything that's manufactured is producing some data about itself or about its condition or about the environment that it lives in. So there's lots of these. And uh, I don't like to, to quote numbers in terms of how many billion devices there are, but we're at the point now where uh, you know, devices are outnumbering people, uh, just like certain insects outnumber people, and that's only going to continue, uh, particularly as the, you know, underdeveloped areas of the world develop. Uh, we, we tend to have more devices uh, than we have people, and I think that what we're going to see is that as the cost of building sensors to report on conditions drops, and it's very low right now, uh, it, the, the speed at which we instrument uh, devices is going to increase. So we need to challenge some, our assumptions, some of our assumptions about what is worth instrumenting or uh, turning into a device that reports on itself and what isn't. This slide uh, is one that I've been actually using for uh, a few years now. It's, from 2014. This is a, uh, a view from a, uh, a website uh, called Thingful. It was in beta in 2014. It was an attempt to create a search engine for IoT devices. And the reason I use this is because I first discovered it when I was uh, giving a talk at the Seaport Hotel and found that in close to real time, I could look at this uh, site and discover how many empty bike 
how many empty spaces there were in the bike rack at the hotel. You could zoom in and look at each of these dots. The uh, different colors represent different types of devices. But the point here is that they're all over. They're different types. They're, uh, you know, out there, some of them are uh, for commercial purposes, like the, the one at the seaport. Some of them are for safety purposes, like some of the sensors in the water uh, tend, tend to represent things like uh, a buoy or a signal. And the challenge is to figure out what value we can get from the data that they're producing. If you're in the business uh, of creating the data, then that's a, a different, uh, different way of looking at the world. But today we're going to look at it as all this data is out there, more is coming. How do we build an architecture that supports it? How do we analyze the value of the data, or the values of the data, and then create value? And, sorry, two different uh, versions of the same word. When I say the value of the data, I'm talking both about the economic value and the actual data itself. So we know, uh, and I'll go fairly quickly through the first few slides here, I just want to kind of set the context in terms of the scope. And this one's, again, from a couple of years ago, that uh, a locomotive that GE was uh, featuring creates 150,000 data points per minute, and these uh, locomotives are expected to last 20 years. So if you think about what that does in terms of the, the life of the locomotive, how much data is created, uh, it's just a, a vast sum. And I was thinking about it last night um, in, in terms of just my own week. I started the week in Connecticut. I drove to an airport in New York. There was data being generated at that point uh, by my phone, by my car, there's sensors in the car get on an airplane and go through the TSA, first of all, there's additional data being generated. Uh, get on the plane, uh, one of the things that everybody uh, talks about as an example is how much uh, data is actually being produced by a jet engine today. So Delta Airlines uh, reports, or it's been reported that they typically process about 5 million business events per day. and uh, Inside joke with Shannon, I would say that's uh, it's a little more when it's raining in Atlanta. But on a typical day, five million business events. A Pratt & Whitney jet engine, it's 5,000 sensors. They're producing 100, I'm sorry, 10 gigabytes per second per engine. This happens to be uh, a Pratt & Whitney engine out of a um, SR Blackbird. Uh, this one predates all the instrumentation, or actually maybe it doesn't. Uh, we just didn't know what they had a few years ago. And Formula One cars are now producing about 1.2 gigabytes per second. So if you look at all of that, these are producing data that we can use for everything from forecasting fuel usage to uh, maintenance requirements. Uh, but we also would like to be able to predict the future. So. When I say predict the future, we're predicting things like uh, the engine is going to fail or a part is going to fail or a part is going to need to be replaced. We've got all of this going on around us, and the question is, how do we take advantage of it? So one way to do this is sort of a simple two-tier IoT architecture where the dots on the left represent sensors. And if you think about uh, that bike rack for a minute, that's a, a pretty simple sensor. It's maybe, it, uh, I forgot how many spaces it had, maybe it had 12 spaces, and each of those has a sensor in it that tells you whether it's uh, being used or it's, it's open. And now they can report, they can report to the world. Generally, you're going to want to have some system, some compute engine, which may be um, the, something as small as a Raspberry Pi, it may be a network, it may be a, a data center, it may be access to an application in the cloud, and that's fine if you have a couple of those. But as you start to build up and scale up, you really, um, I'll just kind of go into it. Now we think about this as being the jet engine example. Uh, you've got hundreds of um, things in, in the engine that could fail or that um, could give you information about activities that you should be undertaking. And as that grows, as the number of um, sensors grows, it just becomes unwieldy. There's also the uh, issue that uh, sensors can either 
uh, be in motion as it would as would be the case with a jet engine or in my car as I'm traveling, uh, or if you've got uh, sensors on a cruise ship, for example. And a lot of the time, uh, they're not gonna be in constant contact with a stationary and reliable uh, compute engine, if you will. So this is not something that scales. What you wanna do, what people are doing today, is moving to a three-tier IoT architecture where you have the sensors and you can still have an external compute engine, but between them aggregating the data from the different sensors or devices are gateways or intelligent gateways. And uh, one of the companies that's doing interesting work on this, I did a, a few um, interviews with them recently that are on YouTube. Uh, Red Hat is building some uh, interesting intelligent gateways as kind of that buffer between the devices and the compute. But once you start to do that, and uh, what you're doing is obviously creating a higher um, bandwidth, uh, but fewer uh, in number connection between the devices and where the computation is being done. That uh, simplifies things, but it also gives you new opportunities. And so, what we can do is to start to uh, move the analytics, the evaluation of the data itself uh, from the compute engine and create these uh, smaller compute engines, if you will, at the device or at the aggregation level. So if let's say uh, one of these is, maybe we're doing an autom automobile system, and the pink color here may be representing uh, information about the engine, the uh, uh, purple maybe about your uh, uh, tires, and instead of having uh, a system like this that's reporting on each tire, including a spare, so you've got five going into uh, the dealer or the manufacturer, that gets aggregated, and so you could actually um, cut those lines, the, the dotted lines, and say, okay, maybe we need to be able to push intelligence and computation out closer to the edge, which is what we show here, and say, maybe we can do some things, uh, things that require heavy lifting, like we're gonna do a machine learning model um, to help do predictive maintenance on an engine. We wanna get a lot of data, we need to train this. We can train the model uh, in a, a, a data center. Um, that was a topic that we talked about last month uh, in the webinar. But you can actually uh, deploy it. You can compress and deploy the deep learning model on an intelligent gateway. So now we're moving the intelligence closer to the edge. In fact, it means that we can kind of cut the cord and we're doing things as they happen or we're reacting to things as they happen um, close to the, the source of the action, and that has a number of benefits. It, um, it means that we're not as dependent on connectivity. We can, um, in the case of uh, the locomotive, for example, uh, we may choose to uh, send some information uh, back to the manufacturer, back to the uh, leaseholder, if it were, um, a leased engine. Uh, in real time as things are happening. Some things we may just batch up and at the end of every run or at the end of uh, every cruise on a ship, then we offload the information. So now let's just distribute the intelligence and the analytics and the computation. And so we have um, things closer to the edge, to the devices themselves, to the sensors, where some computation is going on, we've distributed that. Um, and then ultimately, uh, we can do the things that require, um, that don't require real-time response, uh, get pushed into the cloud or the cluster or the network or whatever sort of uh, device we're using. Now, what happens when we do this though, if we, sorry, going back a, a picture for a second, if different companies are manufacturing devices for different functions, uh, you know, if you're thinking about uh, the automotive world, for example, there are um, several companies that are actually manufacturing cars, but components of cars 
there are uh, similarly there's a, a market there and you'll have uh, half a dozen different companies that are manufacturing tires uh, different companies that are manufacturing spark plugs and one car may have components from several different manufacturers what you want to be able to do is to have this intelligent gateway gather information from the different devices uh, in a way that's standardized so that you can plug and play and you're not dependent on any one uh, manufacturer. And that's where things like the Industrial Internet Consortium come in, where companies like uh, Cisco, GE, and Intel, and IBM, and some of the other members, the, the founding members here, and now there are lots and lots of companies, um, agree on standards for communication between these devices. And really, that's what enables us to build uh, the type of gateway that I was talking about. So, looking into you know, where this is going, now we have different companies that are providing platforms uh, for this communication, and uh, just name some of the, the bigger ones that you, know, you would know about. But as we start to do that, think of these as the infrastructure companies, think of these as the companies that are building um, the roads, if you will, that we're going to travel on with all this information. We need to get from the platform level to uh, building applications, because that's really where the, I don't want to say where the interesting stuff comes from, because if you're working for a platform company, that's pretty interesting too. So now I want to look at what is it that's going to be um, computed and uh, communicated from these various devices. So, very simply, uh, we do a number of uh, chats on analytics. If you have questions about this part of it afterwards, uh, or any of them, obviously, just uh, get in touch. So when we talk about streaming analytics, let's have a, a common definition here first. When we talk about analytics, uh, there's generally a hierarchy. Descriptive analytics are things that uh, describe the known data values. Everything is known, so if I have, um, test scores for a particular class at a high school. I know what the values are, and descriptive analytics might be the mean, the median, the mode, different scores. Uh, you can tie that and say, well, the, the students, um, we can rank them. Uh, there's no uncertainty there. There's, there's the values, and they're easily computed, and they simply describe what has already happened. Higher up on the stack, we have predictive analytics, this is where uh, most of our efforts are today, that use uh, statistics and a model of the world, including your assumptions about the data, whether it's uh, uh, uniformly distributed, what sorts of rules it follows. Uh, but predictive analytics, uh, which gets us into machine learning, machine learning is where we use algorithms to look at the values and compute or estimate with some level of confidence missing values. So if we have information about um, 50 classes of students uh, and we have another school that is, um, has comparable values for other things, then we may uh, predict what they're, how they're going to score on a particular test. So it's either filling in something that uh, has already happened or it's predicting what people are going to do next, and this is where we get things like uh, recommendation engines. Prescriptive analytics, uh, not as common, certainly where we're going. That's where we have um, statistical models that tell us not only uh, the prediction, but what's the next best action. So it's a combination, really, of uh, predictive analytics, if you will, and operational research. Uh, telling you what to do next. So that's the analytics part of streaming analytics. On the data side, the streaming part, I just want to build uh, a similar hierarchy and say, when you think of data uh, that's in a database, for example, it's not going anywhere. Once you put it in, uh, we can change values, but if we take a snapshot at any given point in time, the data is there, so it's static. If we take it a little higher up, uh, what I refer to as the stop and frisk, Data is going from one place to another, and we divert it so that we can analyze it. Uh, that could be if you're dealing with a, um, you're doing water samples in a, um, uh, in an environmental study. You go out and you take water out of the population, you do a sample, and then perhaps you put it back in. Maybe you don't, but basically it's 
changing the flow of data so that you can uh, analyze it. And at the higher level, we have the data that is actually in motion, and what we want to do is to analyze it while it's moving without changing it. And that's where we get into the whole idea of streaming analytics. So the, the problem is, um, as we've known for hundreds of years, uh, you can't step twice into the same river, meaning that uh, it may look the same, but you don't know the actual values that are in there. And so, you know, this uh, adorable little kid is in the water, and if he goes in tomorrow, uh, well, if he goes in, if this one goes in tomorrow, it's going to look a lot different because he's 17 now, but uh, there are different things in the water, even though a lot is the same, you need to be able to take a snapshot and say, what is it that's important that we want to measure? So we need to be looking when the, the data itself is moving, is it something where we can divert it? Is it something where we can pull it? Can we put it to aside? Can we evaluate it without changing the flow? And for those of you that uh, uh, think in terms of physics, we're, we're talking Heisenberg here by um, evaluating something, are we going to change it? In terms of data, that's often the case. We have to divert it, we have to delay it, uh, or we're going to sample it. And sampling is, is valid under some conditions, but under others, it creates more problems. So let's take a quick look at, at that. So streaming analytics, we, we're looking at, uh, I'm going to take uh, prescriptive off the table for the moment, but descriptive and predictive analytics at data that's moving. So when I say streaming analytics, I'm talking about uh, statistical analysis of data in motion. And then the issue is, are we going to move the process to the data or are we going to move the data to the process? If we move the data uh, into, you know, out of our, our stream, if you will, we, we pull it out, uh, we can either sample it or we can make sure that everything goes through a place at which it's uh, can be monitored. Think of it as we have um, water going through a canal and we have locks. We can stop it and we can look at it and then let it go on, but that changes the nature of the data. It changes the value of the data. So the conventional architecture for data analysis is that we've got data flowing on the edges of this graph. We've got the queries that we do on the vertices, so that there's a stopping point. So when something um, is held and it's analyzed, uh, think of when you see uh, documentaries and birds are taken out of the population, uh, they do some measurements, they put a band on the bird and they put it back in. That has changed. The results are not what they would be um, if the data hadn't been moved. Moving to a streaming architecture, a real uh, streaming architecture that we're going to see some examples of in a minute, what happens is at any point where we're going to uh, check this, we're observing, we're, with, sorry, we're observing without uh, deflecting or diverting. And that requires different technologies, and unfortunately the good news is, of course, that they're out there today. There's some interesting stuff going on. I want to talk about how we're going to take advantage of it. So just a, a quick note when I talk about uh, sampling, if you have um, a signal and you're looking at data, um, which is a, an analog sine wave, depending on how often and when you uh, sample it, if you're not looking at every data point along that curve as it goes up and down, uh, in this case, I just sample every period, it would look like um, this is a frequency 440 hertz versus 880, even though the sound itself is going up and down, or the, um, the signal is going up and down, I could sample it like this uh, inadvertently, and then if I go to plot it, it's going to look like it's a constant 880. But if I sample more frequently, and it, we've got a, uh, an analog signal, then I can get a more accurate representation. So when we're doing streaming analytics and the signal is um, something that has a variance in amplitude, for example, or in frequency, uh, pitch, 
uh, then it, it becomes a critical that the model that we have for how the data is um, created is accurate so that we know how to sample it. For the rest of the, uh, the, the webinar, we're going to just focus on things that are where well, we're not sampling. We're really going in and we're going to uh, try and look at every data point. So I'm going to ask you again to, to consider sort of this world where you as an individual are producing data and some of it is streaming data, some of it is uh, more static. And there are things around you that are creating um, data and some of those are uh, streaming and some of those are uh, you know, right in, in your physical space, if you will. And I think that kind of the way to think about the future, the, the stuff that's really interesting and exciting and, and challenging from a technical standpoint is when you have an individual and you have data about them and you have data about the, uh, the immediate environment, right? not what I'm calling environmental data. And just as an example, this morning, um, I'm actually in San Francisco today. I took the train up from San Jose or further south. Uh, as I was looking on the phone, uh, you know, in my iPhone, a uh, typical uh, smartphone has a lot of sensors. I looked at it and I uh, saw my location. I could see it moving. So I was creating data by my device uh, that could have been monitored. I happened to uh, check in on my son to make sure that he'd made it to school on time, 2,500 miles away. I could see because uh, I could see the, uh, the, the data from the sensor on his phone that yes, at that point he was at school or at least he was smart enough to send his phone to school even if he didn't. Um, but now you start to look around and say, okay, as I'm traveling on this train, there are things around me that are creating data. And by knowing about uh, my data and that data, those are new opportunities to create value for me by being aware of, of what I'm doing. So let's take a look at the types of um, infrastructure that we need to build systems that can leverage all that data. And then look at who's doing what in the space. So this is one area um, where you really can't, uh, I don't think today you can see any um, enterprise grade system or any infrastructure upon which you would build an application that isn't heavily dependent on open source uh, software. I, mean, I could certainly make the argument that um, you, you can hardly build anything today without uh, using some open source in your um, uh, infrastructure stack. But here, uh, there's just no way around it because to do the kind of uh, systems that we're talking about, collecting analytics on data that's streaming, uh, as soon as it starts to scale up, we need access to uh, systems that can uh, collect the data, that can aggregate data from different sources, and then uh, do the analysis. And so I'm not going to read through these. I wanted to just give a list. This is a good, uh, good starting point. These are a number of uh, projects from the Apache Software Foundation. So we've got Apache Apex, Flink, SAMHSA, uh, Spark, Storm. All of these are projects that have um, found a following that um, create software at the infrastructure level, if you will, that enable you to build systems on top. So I'll just take a couple Apex. It's a unified stream and batch processing engine. Uh, get into SAMHSA, it's a distributed processing, but here it uses multiple levels of um, other pieces of open source software. In this case, for SAMHSA, it uses uh, Kafka and Hadoop. Uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to just say, uh, you know, if you're dealing with something like Hadoop or Spark um, as uh, storage and compute engines, this is where you're going to put your data so that you can analyze really large uh, quantities of fast-moving data. Um, one of the recommendations at the end, I'll just sort of foreshadow it, is that you really need to start looking at what's available there and which of these projects are getting the most support. These are all fairly um, 
uh, well established. And just as you know, going back to 1999, 2000, you know, so less than than uh, a couple of decades ago, when um, Linux was just starting to get commercialized, um, Red Hat was uh, did their IPO in 99. There was some resistance. Today, I think we're past that, and most people would look at this and say, okay, uh, yeah, if something has made it through the Apache Software Foundation, it's now a top-level project, as uh, most of these are, then it's something that's stable enough, it has enough of a community behind it that we can start to look at products that are developed on top of it. And it is a pretty rigorous process to, to make it to that level. I mean, uh, like most things, there are a lot more projects that are started than finished or that uh, people contribute, but uh, it doesn't make it to that uh, level of um, rigor, if you will, where um, a group like the Apache Software Foundation um, will uh, promote it as a top-level project like you know, Linux became and, and Spark, et cetera. But now we're at the point where this is the place to start, I think, if you're interested in building a fully instrumented um, world, you need to have uh, a data architecture that can handle the volume you're going to deal with and one that's going to be um, developed and refined. Uh, I like to think of it that when we're dealing with um, some of these open source projects, it's not that I mean, it's nice that something uh, may be available for free or at low cost, uh, but the reality is that, that most people that are using these, um, the, the results of these projects are getting them with support from a commercial vendor anyway, so it's probably less expensive than a, a purely um, proprietary solution if you could find one. But the real benefit to building your system, knowing that this infrastructure is underneath, is that you're dealing with something where there's a higher rate of innovation because there are people from different companies that are building it and contributing to the code base. So here's a, um, a more graphical representation of this. And this uh, part of the slide from the folks at Stream, um, a company that I'll mention again in a little bit. But I like the way they put it together. So you, you look at it and say, okay, well, we've got open source projects that collect data. We've got open source projects on the right-hand side for data delivery. This is where things like Kafka and Cassandra, uh, you know, maybe on one or both sides. And then in the middle, we have all these other uh, open source um, components or, or projects that, you know, project is what uh, the term is used for the group or federation, if you will, that's actually um, maintaining and expanding it. And so for each task, there's typically one or more open source project that provides that functionality. So this is kind of the, the whole ecosystem. And there are more, but this is a good uh, representative sample. And so as you look at projects and then you look at the type of applications that you're going to use or um, and using application to indicate uh, any kind of package of uh, functionality, we can start to see that for most of these projects, there are now companies that develop um, expertise and maybe, uh, in, well, frankly, in many cases, uh, the original team that started working on a project that then gets turned over into the open source community, those people go off and uh, commercialize it so you have a number of companies that are focused on uh, companies or uh, university groups uh, typically that are focused on any one of these. And so now we start to see a market develop uh, and, and that's what really builds it and, and frankly takes a lot of the risk out of uh, something where you can't just say, okay, I'm buying this from XYZ company that's been around for 10 years or 50 years or 100 years, and we know that uh, if something doesn't work, we can bring the lawyers in and get it fixed. Well, you can't do that if it's uh, a loose federation uh, that's, that's not a commercial entity. But the fact that so many people are depending on it, by the time it gets to this level of um, maturity, so it's okay, 
now we can start to, to build. So let's look at the types of companies and products uh, that are now building on this infrastructure. So one of the things when we're dealing with um, analytics is you have to have that compute engine that I mentioned. And today, one of the big differences between the way we uh, build systems uh, today and 10 or 20 years ago is that most of the approaches uh, for this type of an application for streaming uh, analytics uh, are going to run uh, at some point in a cloud environment or in a distributed environment. And so you want to look at who are providing platforms for that. And obviously, if we're dealing with uh, cloud services, you're going to be dealing with uh, Microsoft or AWS or Google or IBM on Bluemix. Um, and so it's interesting that from a commercial standpoint, uh, if we take just that, that group, um, Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, Google, and Oracle, I guess, um, each of these companies provides a platform that you can build on. They all use um, some combination of the, or, or permit, if you will, uh, use of some combination of those open source projects. So you can go to um, IBM Bluemix and get uh, access to different databases, different data sources, go to Microsoft uh, Azure and get access to Amazon. But some of them also are developing their own services. And a big part of uh, the, the economic model for this is uh, streaming analytics as a service. So you have to have a platform so that you can have access to the platform in an on-demand uh, fashion. But then you need the, uh, the analytics software on top. Most of the companies that are providing cloud services are providing their own, but also access to uh, any number of commercial vendors that are um, building on those platforms. And so that gets us uh, to just a couple of slides here taking a look. Uh, some of them. So this is Azure with their IoT suite, and you know, it, um, with the Azure suite, you've also got uh, Microsoft Machine Learning and a number of uh, analytics tools. Something uh, similar here. This is uh, AWS, Amazon uh, Web Services. They have a big data analytic framework. And uh, if you just take a quick look, you can see, uh, for example, here it's using Hadoop and Spark which are um, open source projects that they are building on. So you can get access to those at, at different levels. You can access to, in this case, Amazon, uh, less so than with uh, Microsoft. Uh, you would get access to some of their own services. They're more of a, uh, I don't want to say more open, uh, because certainly with uh, AWS or Bluemix, you can build whatever you want on top of it. Um, but you have choices from uh, Microsoft and IBM uh, at the application level, too. So one more here, um, big data and analytics on Lumix. It's the same idea. You can uh, have access at a high level of abstraction where basically you're dealing with APIs and plug and play to figure out what you're going to do, what sort of analytics you need. Uh, and then your your application that you're building, you're more, it's more like you're composing an application from components that are available to you on one of the platforms. Um, yeah, that's the last one I'm going to do with that. So you take that, and then uh, the, the key to the last few slides is that those companies provide both the platform and some of their own uh, applications on top, as well as giving you access to the platform to uh, build on top of with solutions from vendors like uh, Informatica or TIBCO or SAP, SAS. Um, and the idea here is that even though these companies all build um, proprietary commercial software that have some of the functionality that I've been talking about in terms of um, streaming processing, they you're buying that and you're running it, you're executing it, if you will, once you compose it on one of the other platforms. But uh, what I wanted to do today, and we're going to have some time for questions at the end, 
is just to look at uh, another view, if you will, of this whole landscape and say, besides the, the, the actual platform uh, providers, the um, as a service providers, if you will, that will take you right down to the bare metal in some cases, uh, besides the, the big companies that are moving into a SaaS um, model with analytic software that in the past was largely proprietary. There are a number of emerging firms that are focused uh, on the idea, on the, uh, the functions of streaming analytics. They're doing some really interesting uh, work, and I think they're worthy of consideration. So I'm just going to go through um, fairly quickly four of the ones that, uh, that we see is quite interesting. And I put the, the comment at the bottom, integrate and analyze, because that's where um, these things add a lot of value. You want to be able to take data from a variety of sources. If we go back about 20 minutes in the webinar to um, the automobile example, that was a you know almost grotesquely sim uh, simplified, where you had a system for tires and a system for the engine, and maybe a system for uh, um, fuel monitoring, something like that. Uh, in larger applications, if you're trying to um, do business planning, and let's say you've got historical data about your customers, and now you want to also look at uh, that historical data is static. It's not going anywhere. You have information on what your customers have done in the past. And now you have sensor-based data. You know that a customer is in the store. You want to be able to integrate data from um, the, the historical view, the current view, and be able to predict um, next behavior in order to make an offer at the right time. And in the diagram that I had where there's a circle about uh, the individual and you've got information that's streaming and you've got static information and then you've got information about what you have perhaps as your inventory uh, and you know what your offers are and you know maybe we'll take information from an outside source like weather information. If I'm building a system and I've got uh, information about my customer, and let's say I'm a soft drink manufacturer, and I know that the person that's walking by the machine right now uh, has a preference for, uh, we're taking a really low value, if you will, here, for one drink over another. And I know that the uh, proclivity to buy that drink uh, goes up as the temperature goes up. Now, I know that it's going to get hotter in the next two hours, and I'm not going to be able to refill the machine in the next two hours. Maybe I won't make a special offer. Maybe I'll raise the price as the temperature goes up. But to be able to do something like that, I need to be able to integrate data from all these different sources. So in this case, it's about the individual. It's about the, um, the, the stock in the machine. It's information about my supply chain, how long it's going to get there and it's information or data about the weather and the forecast of the weather. So all of these uh, these four are interesting companies in the way that they, they go about integrating and analyze. So uh, data torrent is the first of the four, and for each I'm just going to do one slide, and you know, uh, I'll have resources at the end so you can take a look and do more details. So data torrent, um, a lot of the folks that are involved in data torrent are people who are involved in the uh, original development of Apache Apex, one of the infrastructure times, uh, infrastructure systems uh, that's been promoted to a, a top-level project within the Apache Software Foundation. And here is a, just a representation that shows the kind of data that can be aggregated, which um, open source and uh, systems, this is the, the second um, oval, if you will, where we've got uh, Hadoop uh, on the, the top, but that it's using Amazon Web Services as one of the uh, the way to get to it. And then in the center is what the actual data torrent uh, system, as they say, powered by Apex, uh, which is their development here. Um, what it runs on, so this is showing that, yes, it, it interacts with uh, other systems, but you can run it on AWS, you can run it on Azure. So if you have a uh, preference or a standard in your organization that you're only building on, uh, AWS or Azure, it gives you more options. And then showing what the, the features are in terms of analytics 
on the data in motion and visualization. And visualization is something that we really don't have time to, to get into uh, much detail in terms of how these things differentiate based on uh, visualization, but that's obviously a, a key way of evaluating the different tools. So that's uh, data torrent um, stream. Uh, I had uh, one of their diagrams earlier, stream, the, it's pronounced stream, but the uh, double I uh, is re <laughs> refers to integration and intelligence. And this is an, another one that's uh, doing some really interesting stuff. Again, built uh, on aggregating and integrating uh, data from a variety of sources. And it's a little difficult to read on the, uh, the blue background here. Uh, but we've got Kafka and Flume um, and other um, open source projects that are uh, feeding into it. Uh, it IO through um, Hadoop, uh, which um, Hadoop is still sort of a, uh, a, a major presence in the market, even though uh, Spark is, uh, gets all the, the buzz today. Um, <clears throat> so we can use Hadoop and feed Spark from Hadoop. Uh, it, it just interacts, pulls it all together, and allows you to do the kind of uh, intelligence that I was talking about earlier, where we're pushing the intelligence um, to where it needs to be. And so uh, the integration here is with the existing jobs, the uh, ETL, extract, transform, and load jobs. So this is uh, just a, a diagram that does a pretty good job, I think, of showing how they can pull in the data from the legacy applications. And you could do the kind of thing I was just describing where you're looking at that historical data about the customer. And now we're looking at the real-time application, what's going on with the customer right now, and another data source, go back to my example with the weather, uh, that allows you to start to do predictive analytics based on all these different data sources. Uh, stream analytics. Stream analytics uh, comes from a company called Impetus. Uh, stream analytics is a, uh, a, a derivative business um, out of the, the Impetus uh, company. And basically, uh, this is a, um, sort of, I hate the term next generation, but it, it's a, a very, um, current uh, way of approaching this integration of data from the multiple sources that we talked about, uh, doing the analysis, and uh, being able to do predictive um, analytics based on uh, current and historical. And what's interesting here is that um, Impetus was more of a uh, services company and started to develop what uh, became stream analytics out of their services business uh, because they were getting um, repeated requests to build systems that did this, and so they turned that into a product. And I think it's, uh, again, it's, it's one of the four that I'm going to mention today uh, that I would encourage you to take a look at. And finally, um, Zoom data. What uh, to me was interesting about uh, Zoom data is that their approach um, is sort of a, a model of um, aggregation and visualization, if you will, uh, that looks like a VCR. So you can look at the data, um, integrate, again, all of these will allow you to, uh, to pull in data from different sources, including historical, uh, more static data, and uh, stuff that's acquired real time as streaming data, and uh, then start to make some uh, predictive analysis based on that. But what's uh, interesting about their approach is that they break the world, the a query about the data up into what they call micro queries that can run in parallel over very large data sets. And the, the, the thing that uh, I found uh, very interesting here is that you can very quickly get a view of um, the, the, the query that's uh, perhaps more abstract than the ultimate one, but it starts to refine as it goes through and processes these micro queries, and they refer to that as data sharpening. So you get uh, something that um, can be used very quickly, and 
that may change the the following queries the, the or the subsequent queries that you make uh, based on early information rather than waiting for a a complex query uh, to go through. It's not a sampling technology. So there, uh, it's the the actual um, sharpening algorithms that they use that I think is interesting. Let's see if I can advance this. All right. So to get started, uh, I say this uh, almost ad nauseum. I, I'm sorry, but it's always about the data. So if you're looking at this now and we're, we're thinking about the IoT, how do I get started? Well, I've said that you're going to start by looking at uh, open source tools and you're going to uh, try and uh, choose an infrastructure that will let you um, look at both your historical data and your real-time data to do your analytics. But in terms of figuring out which applications um, you can upgrade or you know, turn into streaming data, um, the, the idea is to look at where you have that historical data. But now the other part that you have to look at for the next, you know, this is one way to get started in the next 6, 12, 18 months. But if you're going to look at a business and say, well, how am I going to leverage my data assets? Uh, what you use as assets in a year from now uh, may not even exist today. The sensors may not even exist today. So you need to be looking at how you're going to create um, new sources of data, new aggregations of data, uh, and new algorithms, frankly, for creating that value based on this combination of streaming and static data. And with that, I'm going to, yep, we got uh, eight or nine minutes, open it up to questions. Uh, I will just say that uh, I know Shannon will tell you about uh, getting a copy of the slides. Um, I have a number of references so for each of the, the products, but also each of the open source projects. Uh, there are links and more information. I'll just say we've got uh, more in the series coming up, and I've got some new content that if you uh, check out on Aragon Research, you can see that too. So be in touch, send me an email, and if you want to connect on LinkedIn, I have to say this because Every month I get uh, uh, LinkedIn requests with no context, and if you uh, if you want to connect because you've heard one of the webinars, just tell me that. I'll be happy to connect. All right, Shannon, can I turn it back to you? Adrian, thank you for another great presentation. Um, feel free to submit your questions in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen in the Q&A section if you have any questions for Adrian. And just a reminder, as Adrian mentioned, that I will be sending a following be sending a follow-up email by the end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session. Um, everyone's being very quiet today, Adrian. I think you, you explained it all. We there there we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so no questions coming in. So that's that's great. Um, so just uh, as Adrian is showing there, there's additional um, resources for you that we'll get in the follow-up email as well. And uh, next month, we hope you all will join us for machine learning case studies. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, uh, that's an, another hot topic for our audience, I know. So. Thanks everyone for everything and Adrian, thanks for another great presentation and I hope everyone has a great day. Oh, oh I forgot I was actually, on mute. We oh, do we, actually we we did have a question come in right at the last second here. So I'm um, just really quickly, Adrian, so can you comment a bit on the um Apache uh Edgent project? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Can you comment a bit on the Apache uh, Edgent project? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, E-D-G-E-N-T project. Ooh. Um, no, not not intelligently <laughs> in the time that we have, but if uh, somebody's, let me ask you, if the person that uh, asked that, I can't see the questions right now, I'm in a, um, a space where I don't, all I can see right now is unfortunately my own slides, um, but if the person that, uh, ask the question is in the process of evaluating um, or wants to know about contributing, uh, by all means, let's put that in um, the queue and when you send that to me, I'll, I'll write up an answer that goes out to everybody. Uh, yeah, absolutely. They provided a link to it. 
Yeah, okay. I'll get awesome. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. All righty. That, that is it. That's, that's all the questions for today. Adrian, again, thank you so much, and thanks to all of our attendees for, for joining in in the presentation. Hope everyone has a great day, and we'll see you next month. Great. Take care. Thanks.